for me the authority in my life is first God particularly through Christ then my parents my mother was a rock and taught me the importance of faith and family and church my stepdad on the other hand was a stubborn, short-tempered, opinionated, crow-hating German immigrant who taught me how to fish, how to laugh, and how to enjoy life. Through these two wonderful people, I was given the authority to live life to the fullest, deeply rooted in my family, in my faith, and the church, while not taking myself too seriously. Today, we encounter the scripture that commissions the disciples with the authority of Jesus himself. Jesus instructs the 12 disciples on how to labor in the harvest by giving them the same authority over demons and diseases that he has. Jesus instructs the disciples to go and do everything that he does. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons embodying the realm of God through healing, through real relationship, and through encounters with others. Being Jesus' modern-day disciples, we are given the power and the authority to do the same things, the things that are needed to embody the realm of God. What would the world look like if the primary ways by which we imagined how to follow Jesus were these imperatives. It seems that the two acts of discipleship in particular, according to the Gospel of Matthew, that we are to embody and that are critical to our ministry are healing and liberation. Jesus commissions his disciples and by proxy us to perform the very works that he does, calling them to advance beyond him into new and emergent settings. Whether with Jesus or commissioned by Jesus, the authentic proclamation of the good news is marked by healing and by liberation. The blind see, the lame walk, the leper is cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead live. All of these signs accompany the proclamation of the good news. And Jesus gave those first 12 clear instructions. But then he sent them forth to do his works and to proclaim his message. Once sent, however, they are on their own. They must assess the responses that they get and then they are to determine whether to stay or to move along. But we must realize that instruction, while good, only takes us so far. The faithful church, like those first 12 disciples, must move beyond Jesus himself as the disciples did. Yet many Christians and too many churches want direct, specific instructions on every issue. A young man recently asked me for guidance as to what the Bible says about sex. Now he seemed surprised when I suggested that perhaps he was asking the wrong question. When we think about things like economics and government, we don't necessarily ask the Bible to tell us how to manage these things directly or specifically. Instead, we ask how the Bible may inform our vision of a just society. And 
most of the Bible's instructions concerning sex address things like a man's obligation when he has sexual relations with an unmarried woman or which sexual partners are allowed and which are permitted and how to test whether a woman has committed adultery or not or how to marry a desirable slave woman. You see, the Bible simply does not address things like dating or egalitarian relationships and women who have built lives of their own. So in this conversation, I suggested that the parts of the Bible that were most pertinent to our sex lives might say nothing about sex at all. Don't things like honesty and compassion, justice and love say more to us today than what to do about a woman who displeases her husband on their wedding night? You see, the point's simple. Our search for instructions often detracts from the main point. When the realm of he heaven is breaking out, we find healing and liberation. And this is what we need to know. Friends, we've been given the authority to be healers and liberators in this less than healthy, often oppressive and unjust world. Jesus' ministry and that of his disciples and us entails the exorcism of demons, an issue, an issue that might pose a stumbling block to some of us. One path is simple, we just ignore that part of the scripture. As modern people who find the image of Linda Blair's head spinning around, bed floating, green vomiting antics to be rather baffling or irrelevant. Yet, think about it. Even those of us who cannot get our imagination around real demons tormenting poor individuals can relate to what it means to be bound, to be bound by a power one feels powerless to resist. Such demons need not be found only in those people, but they reside whenever evil has us firmly in its grip. Many, all, people find themselves bound, bound by behaviors or patterns or structures they cannot escape, they cannot get free of often cursing themselves when they repeat that same destructive behavior time and time again. So when we might imagine the realm of exorcism, I say let us imagine liberation. Freedom from those powers that constrain us, that prevent us from living those full human lives that God has called us to. Now Jesus also says in our scripture this morning, receive freely and give freely. The disciples received a place in that movement to the realm without paying for it. In the spiritual and simplified way of speaking that we sometimes use to explain grace, they received basically a place in the realm as an act of unmerited favor on the part of God. It is sheer gift. Now as disciples, they are to carry that good news on their mission, and they are to offer it as sheer gift. Now because Christians have a tendency toward work righteousness, the church sometimes interprets repentance or healing or work toward liberation as just that, work. And churches, sometimes unintentionally, communicate that stewardship or the giving of our gifts, our time, and our talent is a work that Christians should perform in order to have a place in God's circle of friends or even to have a place in the church. But in the context of first century Judaism, repentance is not a work, but a response 
to God's grace. Indeed, the divine initiative manifesting grace is what makes repentance and stewardship possible. Christians receive God's grace and a place in the community as a gift. And one of the ways that we respond to this gift is through the stewardship of our time and our talent and our treasures. A birthday party comes to mind. The little girl who was celebrating her birthday, she received the perfect gift, exactly what she wanted. And in response, she jumped up and she ran to her dad and she threw her arms around him in a gesture of love. Stewardship, folks, is a way for us to wrap our arms around God in a gesture of love. As always, we are invited to see ourselves and our church in this story of the disciples. Here the disciples imitate Jesus, who not only proclaims the realm of heaven, but demonstrates in how he lives and in his nature and in what he does, what it means. When the realm of God is near, healing and liberation take place. And like the disciples, the church finds itself cast into that same role. Into the world where we are to take Jesus' message beyond his instructions into surprising new context. And healing and liberation are great places to start with the authority that we, as God's children, as Jesus' followers, have been given.